If you live in a house with an integrated garage, you probably notice that the garage takes up quite a large amount of your ground floor space and maybe you've considered converting it. If that is the case, this video is for you because I'm gonna go through things you should consider before you start the work and things to pay attention to during the work to give you a fantastic space for you and your family. So, the two questions you've got to start with when you're planning a garage conversion is one, what are you gonna do with all the stuff that's in your garage right now? And two, what could you do with that space? So let's start with the stuff. If you have, like us and most households, accumulated years worth of things that you think you might use but never quite have, then those things have got to go. You're going to have to tidy up. Either put them on eBay, recycle them, give them to friends, throw them away, whatever you need to do. But there'll also be things that you don't want to get rid of. Important things like maybe bikes, um, family bikes, or the lawnmower, or tools that you've accumulated. Those things are going to have to go somewhere. So you need to maybe think about what your options are. If you've got space in the garden for a shed, brilliant. Buy one of those, move all the stuff in there and you are good to go, you've got the space. Uh, we were actually lucky enough to have space alongside the house to actually build another garage. So we just moved everything from one room to another, giving us the space to convert. But obviously not everybody has that option. So you're gonna have to probably be a little bit um, blunt, let's say. Um, your other alternative is actually just converting half the garage. In our last house, we decided that we still needed the garage space for bikes and everything, and I had a motorbike at the time, and so that had to go somewhere, but we wanted an office. So we had a wall built right in the middle of the garage, still had the up and over door at the front with all the garage things in, but then the back, that was actually accessible from the house, and that became an office. So we put a window in the side for some natural light, and it was brilliant. It served our needs perfectly. We got the extra room, but we still had that practicality of having a garage, which... If you're putting a car in a garage, then fantastic. Um, not many people do, though. It is just largely a concrete shed that happens to take up a huge percentage of your space in the house. So it's, it's actually pretty good to be able to reclaim it. Integral garages in the UK, generally, if it's a single garage, will be somewhere around about 12 to 14 square metres. And if it's a double garage, it could be anywhere between 25 and 30 square metres. So it's a lot of room that sat there being used essentially as a dumping ground in many houses. Um, so the opportunity there is massive. But before you get started, you've got to do a lot of planning. Uh, and I would suggest you do all this before you even speak to any builders. Have a good idea in your head about the specifics of what you're going to do with the room. I would always suggest you start externally. In fact, not just the aesthetics, understand what you can and can't do to your house. So our house, for example, we bought this house three years ago, and as such, we have a covenant within the uh, agreement of buying the house that we weren't allowed to change anything about the exterior without getting permission from the developers. So we had to write to them, talk to them about what we planned on doing, um, put it all on a bit of a plan, which I put together, uh, and then pay £100 to them to send a letter saying, yes, that's fine. Um, so bear that in mind before you do anything. But once you've got that sorted, you've got to think planning externally. How's it going to look? So when you look at your house, bear in mind where the windows are, um, the type of brick, whether or not there's special window sills, and try and think whether or not when you fill in the garage door with some sort of window space or wall or both, um, how's it going to look in comparison to the rest of the house? So aesthetically, does it work? Um, we have a double garage that we converted and above we had two windows. So I was very keen to make sure that the windows that we put downstairs matched-ish the windows upstairs so there were at least some sort of continuity and symmetry to the house. So bear those things in mind externally before you even start thinking about what you're going to do internally because obviously that's the first thing you're going to be seeing. When you move to the internal planning, the first thing I'd suggest you start with is the things that you can't do anything about. Now what I mean by that is again using our house as an example, and it's quite common is you'll find that in the garage you will find your consumer unit for your electricity coming into the house. Um, that being the case, that's going to be really difficult to move. So that needs to be part of your plan. Um, for us, we just built a cupboard around it, but you have to decide, is it going to be a cupboard that's just the size of the unit? Do you want some that's floor to ceiling so you can put other things in there, perhaps still keep some tools in the house? Also, if your consumer unit is on an outside wall of the garage, there's a good chance that your electricity meter is in the same point on the outside of the house which point there's a good chance the gas meter will be right next to it. So there's probably gas pipes coming into your house right next to the consumer unit. These things cannot be moved. So you have to bear in mind when you are planning the inside, they are going to be part of the room. 
Now what we decided within this room, um, and admittedly we spoke to the builders about it um, once we'd agreed one, I'll get to that in a little while, but we'd already decided that the best thing we could do was actually build the wall out because it was currently breeze block, it had the consumer unit, it has gas pipes, electricity and um, cables feeding in. So what we actually got them to do was build it out, wood battens across and then plasterboard onto it. And I said, I'll come back to that, that's a little bit further down the line. But that was at least a solution to something that we knew we couldn't get around, but it actually gave us the opportunity and the freedom to be able to do more creative things with the audio and the visual cabling, which I'll talk about in a little while. Now you have an idea of the elements of the room that you can't change, you need to decide what you're going to do with the space. You know, is it going to be a bedroom? If it is, then uh, who's it going to be a bedroom for and what are their needs going to be? If it's a, one of the children that wants some space downstairs, then you know, maybe you wouldn't necessarily have to add their own washing facilities. But if it was maybe a relative who had accessibility issues and they were moving in and they needed to be on the ground floor, they're probably going to need some facilities to be able to wash. In which case, you need to think about plumbing. So you know, what are the rooms around the garage where you could take a plumbing feed from for drainage and a water source? So you need to start to think about those things uh, if that's the purpose you have in mind. If it's a living room, then it's a little different. You probably won't need quite the drainage element, though plumbing will still be important because you'll still need to put a radiator in it, but we'll get to that a bit later on. So what I would suggest you start by doing is actually drawing a scale model of the room or scale drawing of the room. So measure every dimension, every nook and cranny that you can find, including say, for example, you know, behind me, we had this, I had to include this in the measurement because this couldn't be changed. So draw everything, including of course the door into the room. Uh, assuming the room has a door, um, most integral garages generally can be accessed from inside the house. Um, but if you're converting it to a room, you'll probably have to put a door in. But make sure that any drawing you do includes the door. And then you can start to think about windows in terms of where exactly you want them. You've looked at it externally to get the aesthetics, but when you start to model that room, then you can start to play around with it just a little bit, but always keeping that in mind. Once you have your scale drawing of the room, you then need to draw and cut out to exactly the same scale all the things that you plan to put in the room. If it's a bedroom, then that's the bed, wardrobe, dressing table, whatever you need. If it's the living room, it's things like the settee, the cabinet you're going to put your hi-fi or, or television on, uh, any additional seats. Draw and cut all of them out and then start to play with it. Have your scale drawing and just try things in different places until you can find something that really meets your needs. But do not forget that right now where you have a garage door, you will have windows and so therefore the sun's going to be coming in. So plan your room around that. If, for example, the sun shines into that room through the windows of an evening, you probably don't want your TV on the wall opposite because it's just going to serve as a mirror for you sitting and watching it. So maybe the whole thing needs moving 90 degrees. Really think about lighting, natural lighting, and then we'll talk about um, uh, additional lighting in a minute. But make sure you bear that in mind when you're planning the location of things. And just try things. Just experiment now while it's easy and there's no repercussions because the planning you do now will dictate where your plugs go, where your lights go, where your sound cabling goes, where your projector goes, screen, all these things that you might consider. This is where you decide. So do it before any bricks are laid and have a good idea in your head just from planning. So once you've got that plan and you've got a good idea in your head what's going where, you then need to move on to the all important point of budget. Now your budget will fall into two categories. One is the building of the, the actual room, so the work, the stuff that a builder is gonna do, a plaster, an electrician, a plumber, a joiner, all those elements. The other is the contents. Do not underestimate how much money you will spend on the things that go in the room. Now, if it's a bedroom, then it's easy enough to go and look at the price of a bed and a wardrobe and all those things. That's not such a big deal to work out. It's fairly transparent. The things you've got to bear in mind is if you are going to go down the living room or cinema route, there are loads of little incidentals that might not occur to you. If you want full cinema surround in a room like we have in here, that meant upgrading the amplifier. That meant upgrading all the speakers. That meant additional speakers. That meant buying a projector. That meant putting all the cabling in. And you will spend a lot of money on cabling if you're not careful with the planning but you do want the best cabling in because once it's in it's in I mean it's going to be plastered around there's nothing you can do I would always encourage you to overspend on cabling that is out of mind out of sight and unupgradable without ripping walls apart so make sure you do plan with your budget um, 
by all means, speak to experts. Go and walk into a shop if you're planning hi-fi. Places like Richer Sounds, those guys are brilliant. They know exactly what they're talking about. Go in and tell them what you're planning and they will talk you through exactly what you need and they'll probably give you a great price on it as well. So, you know, go and encourage, I would encourage you to go and speak to experts, people who know what you're planning on doing better than you do um, because you'll find that information really useful down the line. Now, in terms of the building work, I personally would suggest that you speak to a building contractor because they would have relationships with all the tradespeople that are listed earlier that you are going to need to build it. A lot of um, building contractors tend to be builders themselves, so they'll be in charge of the brickwork and then they'll bring the appropriate people that they work with in to do the other bits. You can try and do all that yourself. There's nothing stopping you getting to know an electrician, a plumber, a joiner, etc., to be able to put all these components together. But it means you've got to try and synchronize time. You, you are reliant on one person finish, finishing on exactly the day they said they will for the next person to come in for the next, but, and it becomes a domino effect if one person's late. Whereas a building contractor, yes, you'll pay a tiny bit more for them, but they will arrange all that. So it's one less thing to worry about. And there will be plenty of other things for you to be thinking about. Now, whether you're using the information from experts, such as, as I mentioned, the guys at Richer Sounds, um, or doing it yourself, which I did because I like AV, so I must have been, I've got a fairly decent knowledge there. Essentially, you want to break your planning down into three sections. The first one is lighting. Um, lighting's really, really important. I know I touched on just there the natural light that will come from your windows, but you've also got to think about what um, unnatural light, what additional light you're going to put in the room, whether it's spotlights, whether it's a single light, what's there right now, do you want indirect lights on the walls? You've got to plan all these things separately. So okay, going back to your scale drawings, print several copies, you know, scan them in, photocopy them, whatever you need to, whatever you need to do. Allocate one for lighting, another one for power and a third one for AV, so your audio visual, um, because you are gonna need quite specific plans for each. So back to lighting. You've got to bear in mind what you're hoping to achieve from the lighting. So if it's a cinema room, you probably don't want just an on-off light. You want something that's got a dimmer uh, capability and maybe something that changes color. What we put in this room are nine spotlights that each one has a Philips Hue bulb in it. Now what the Philips Hue bulb allows us to do is change the level of brightness, but also change the color. So we found that if we're watching a film in here, I don't really want it completely dark, but if we put it in a nice dark blue, it's really nice ambient light that doesn't distract you, but still gives you visibility in the room, and we really like that. But if you're working in here, then you want full light, so in which case you want something that's gonna bright, uh, brighten up the room. So think about what you want from your lights, because there's a couple of elements that are really gonna come into play. It's great you having a plan and knowing what you want, but at the same time, there are gonna be limitations because obviously they're going in the ceiling and it depends on what your garage has right now as a ceiling. Um, ours had a fully plastered ceiling and uh, we agreed with the builders in the end that it was a good idea to probably rip it down and start again because there was so much up there that we both needed to see. Um, I needed to know where beams were. I needed to know where piping was because there's a bathroom above us. I needed to know where our opportunities were to access the plumbing to put a radiator in here because again, there was pipe work in the, in the ceiling. But crucially, I also needed to know where, where I could put speakers, where I could put lights because if you've got a, an in-ceiling fitting, then it's going to need this much space or so above the ceiling. So I would really encourage you, if you can, get the ceiling ripped down because it will allow you to plan so much easier, particularly when it comes to lighting and also with sound. Um, so I'm gonna to touch on power next though. Um, so on your second planning diagram, you've gotta think about where you're going to put your plugs. Uh, it may seem like an obvious thing, you know, just to put them here and there on the uh, ground level, but in actuality, if you're creating an AV room, so an audio-visual room like a cinema, then you're gonna need plug sockets all over the place in unusual places. So in this room, for example, because we added a projector screen at the front, which is an electric projector screen, that's a radio controlled, and it drops down, uh, and I built a casing around it, which I'll show you on uh, a video in a moment, um, that meant that we needed power sockets right up at ceiling level at the front of the room. But because we were using a projector, that also meant that we needed a ceiling um, mounted plug right at the back of the room. So you've got to plan these things. You cannot find yourself with everything finished and then thinking, how am I gonna plug that in? Because you're gonna end up with ugly trunking. And it's all completely avoidable because you've got the beautiful benefit of being able to plan the room from scratch. So you can put whatever cabling in where you want, providing you plan in advance. Now the third area is uh, AB. Now audiovisual, I would also include internet within this as well, because you've got to bear in mind in most modern rooms going down the cinema living room route, uh, a lot of your devices will be reliant on internet connections, whether it's a gaming console, whether it's your television, whether it's even the projector, your amplifier, 
maybe some sort of streaming box, all of these things will rely on internet connections. So you've got two choices. You either hardwire it or you use Wi-Fi. If your Wi-Fi connection in the garage is good now, then it will be good when it's converted. So in which case, not a problem. However, if it's not so great, you may need to try and think about how you're gonna get a hardwired connection into there. So that would mean an actual physical internet socket in the room, an ethernet socket in the room that somehow is connected to your router. Now that can either be a direct cable, maybe it's one that uses electricity sockets because there's various um, setups you can buy now that use the electricity sockets or network in your house to transfer uh, ethernet connectivity, which is great. Um, what we did is I have a switch in the loft that feeds the internet to several rooms in the house uh, and our main connection goes up to it. So I fed a cable in the cavity of the wall from the loft right down to this conversion that allowed a hardwired connection and then another switch down here, which I know means it's slightly out of sync if you're into your tech, um, but it works really, really well. So uh, we have everything hardwired in here, but you've got to bear that in mind. Um, and when you're talking your AV connections, there are essentially basics and there's complex. If you're going basic, which maybe say is just a television, then you will need an aerial connection if you're going to use any of the terrestrial or digital television channels, um, or said if you're going to stream everything, then you'll need the digital connectivity uh, through an ethernet connection. Um, but you'll also need to be able to get whatever source you're using to get a signal from there to the television. Now, if the television's sat in a cabinet, that's fine. It's all very straightforward. Cables are down the back. If it's going on the wall like we did in our room, then you have to make sure that you can get the cable connections from the bottom of the room, where essentially probably your cabinets are, to the television in the middle of the wall. So something behind. Now, I would always suggest when you have the opportunity, use some sort of trunking. If you plaster cables into the wall, that's it, they're done. If they get damaged, you've got a problem. If you want to add an additional cable, you can't. But if you can get trunking in there, which might mean, mean perhaps digging out a little bit of the brick if you haven't got much space to be able to put some trunking in, or because we were lucky enough to be able to um, have access to the space behind uh, our TV because it's on the same wall where the gas and the electricity came in. So therefore battens, we built it out. So I could put really thick trunking behind going from ceiling right down to floor with the TV in the middle. So cables can go in at the bottom or the top and come out at the television, which gave us a lot of freedom and it's future proof. We can add or take away as we choose moving forward. So that's the AV element just from the picture, for say from a television. But if you're going for something more complicated, like say a projector, which looks brilliant and it's well worth doing, you've got to bear in mind the projector is going to be at the opposite end of the room probably from where all your components are, like your amplifier or your, said, your, your TV source. Maybe it's a fire stick, maybe you've got some other streaming box, whatever. Or, you know, they're going to be at one end of the room, the projector's going to be at the other. So you need to bear in mind you have to physically connect the two. So to do that, you're going to need a really long HDMI cable. Now, if you are, if you do it converting a double garage, then inevitably it's going to be pretty much the same distance whichever way you set it up. It's going to, you're going to need realistically a five meter cable is not going to be enough. You're going to need a 10 meter HDMI cable. I'll come back to that in a second. If you're converting a single garage and you're going across the garage, then it's not really very big. So I'm not sure I'd justify a projector. So presumably you're going lengthways, in which case you're still going to need a cable that's probably 10 meters long. Now, the thing to remember when you buy a 10 meter HDMI cable, if you want to maintain a 4K signal, which again, for the sake of future proofing, you should, um, at least 4K if you can, then the chances are a lot of those cables at that particular length, one, they're quite expensive, but two, they're actually uh, omnidirectional. So the signal can only go one way. So for goodness sake, when you install it, make sure you install it the right way. Um, I didn't. And it was a hell of a job to get this cable out from in a fully plastered ceiling and then refit. Um, a lot of hours were invested in doing that. So yeah, make sure you do get that right. Uh, but that's the picture. So that will send a picture to your projector, but you are going to need sound because a single projector is just not gonna, the, the speakers on them are not gonna be enough to fill the room. So you're gonna need a hi-fi. So I so said that means buying an amplifier and then the dedicated speakers. Now, you've got to bear in mind when you're buying your amplifier, you've got to just basically see how much you're willing to spend and what kind of sound you want. So when you talk about uh, hi-fi sound, the one that's kind of oldest that you, you may be familiar with is 5.1 sound. Now what that means is five speakers and one subwoofer. Generally, one at the front, one on each side at the left and right. So the front one is the center speaker and audio from like, you know, vocal audio tends to come from there. So it looks like the person on the screen is talking to you and it sounds like it. Um, front, left and right, and then surround left and right. But then you've got 7.1, which is the front, 
the two at the front, two at the side and two at the back. But then you can get into the more interesting stuff, which is the Dolby Atmos, which is full surround like you have in a cinema. Um, and then you're on to um, three numbers. So for example, you can have a 5.2.1. So that would be the five speakers, one at the front, two at the front, two at the back. And then the point two is ceiling speakers, so left and right, and then the point one is the subwoofer. So you need to decide what you're gonna wire based on how much you're willing to spend on the amplifier. So in our room, uh, we bought an amplifier that was capable of 5.4.2 or 7.2.2. So either seven surrounds uh, in that sense, plus two in the ceiling and then two subwoofers, a left and a right, or five surrounds, four in the ceiling, and then two subwoofers. And we went with the 5.4.2. So my planning point of view is all, if all this sounds very complicated, this is why you need to make sure you do enlist help. Um, but I would encourage you to spend some time on the Dolby website um, because in actuality, they give you wiring diagrams of where, or planning diagram, diagrams of where all the speakers should be for every one of those setups. And it's quite brilliant. I'll put the link in the uh, description below. Um, but if you spend some time on there and then go back to your planning document, if you remember, you've got your, your scale drawing and start to think, okay, where are you gonna sit? And then therefore, where's the screen going to be? Where's the projector going to be? And therefore, where do the speakers need to be? Um, I meticulously planned exactly where everything had to be and literally they are correct to the millimeter because you want that sound to be right. If you're gonna spend that kind of money, you want it to be right. But in doing that, if you plan like we did with the one at the center, two on one on each side, and we went for floor standing, so that's fine to be fair. We still ran the cables into the wall up across and then down to the amplifier, which is in the middle, um, or you could just lead cables across if you did. Depends how, how fussy you want to be. I didn't want to see any cables. But the side speakers, because I didn't go for surrounds, I went for side speakers that point backwards and forwards. Uh, here's a picture of them. Um, so these are quite cool, and they said they, they really do envelop you. Um, those, that cable had to be fed in before plastering and fed up into the ceiling, across the beams, across the front, and then down to where the amplifier. But then we also had to make sure we, we measured perfectly, and I had to adjust the, the position of these um, two or three times because of the positions of beams first, so it meant I couldn't get the symmetry because you want the equal distance. Um, but also there was um, a drainage pipe from the bathroom above that meant that I couldn't put it where I wanted there, so I had to move the back ones in a little bit. So if I'm doing one, I had to do the other just for that symmetry to get the, the equal sound. Um, so this is why the ceiling being down is quite advantageous. It allows you to really look around and plan accordingly. But once you've got that, fantastic. You can measure it, you can mark it, and this is the key. Once you've got that ceiling down, you can see all the beams, write the distance from one wall on every beam and photograph it all the way along and keep those photographs because they're really useful. Because it means that when you come to cut holes in the ceiling to actually fit the speakers, because you'll have left the cables up there, if you've wired it in and just maybe put some excess and pinned it up there, fed it to the front, you need to know exactly where you're going to cut uh, and the cables will be waiting for you. But if you don't write those measurements down and get them right, then you end up cutting in the wrong place, you're gonna make a mess of your shiny new ceiling. Exactly the same with the lighting. Measure everything meticulously and photograph all of it. Keep those, knowing where those things are is really, really important. Um, on that, uh, in addition to putting the audio cables through and putting the video cables through, you've also got to bear in mind if you're putting a ceiling projector up uh, and a ceiling mounted um, projector screen, what are you going to screw them to? So if they don't line up exactly with the battens, um, the ceiling battens going across, then you need to fit some sort of bracket before it's plastered so that no, you know that when you try and screw it up, you're screwing into something and not just empty space. So all this planning that you have to do in advance is really important and that's where it comes down to making sure you've got your scale drawings. One for light, one for power, one for AV. Because the AV bit can get very complicated, but it's worth it because it sounds amazing when it's finished and you've done it right. Now you may be thinking that there are easier solutions than putting all this wiring in, and you're right. If you just want the television on the wall, fantastic. You can buy Sonos components, for example, have a play bar underneath your television and a couple of surrounds. If you're doing that, remember, on your diagram, you'll need to plan plug sockets behind you for the surrounds and plugs at the front for the play bar. But that's an option. You could do that. That would be a simple way to do it. Have all your AV inputs, so HDMIs, hopefully in the trunking, going into your television and then one output from the television to the play bar, which would then create the surround sound. And that's definitely an option.
If you go the projector route, you don't really have any choice with regards to an amplifier. At the end of the day, a projector, as I said before, the speakers on it aren't very good. So you have to have a different way to generate sound. And plus, projectors don't have tuners and things built in them. They only play what you send to them. So you need some sort of source that sends a video signal to them. So an amplifier, you could have a PlayStation, your Skybox, your Fire Stick, your Apple TV, all those things could be going in as inputs. And then you just choose it on the amplifier and what one video output then gets sent to the projector and to all the speakers. If you have um, a projector set up where you try not to use an amplifier, you're gonna struggle for sound because you won't be able to handle all the different inputs. So plan all these things when you're thinking about it. When you're deciding what you're going to do from an AV point of view, really sit down and understand your options. Once you've made that decision, then you can plan all the cabling. And make sure that when it comes to actual installation point, once the work actually begins, that you play an integral part in that. Because you need to do all this planning before you can talk to the uh, building contractor. Uh, because when he gets an electrician in and the electrician gives him a quote, it's based on whatever requirements you've generated. So you need to do all this planning before anything else happens. Otherwise, you will find yourself facing problems that you could have avoided if you just planned a little bit better. So I suppose in conclusion, things to consider when you're converting your garage. One, planning. Goodness me, you cannot plan enough. Think very, very hard about what you want it to look like from the outside, the height of the windows, the width of the windows, everything. Make sure you get permission from the developer if your house isn't particularly uh, old, in which case I said you probably will, will need permission. If you're converting a garage, you will need building regulations to come and check it out and check that everything's up to standard in terms of insulation and stuff. You won't need planning permission, but you do need building regs approval. Uh, next one is be very clear about what you're going to do with the room. So what are your intentions? What are your plans? What's the main purpose of it? And then five from there, do your three diagrams. Plan meticulously where your furniture is going to go and as a result, where your power's going, where your lighting's going, where your AV's going, if you're doing a cinema. And then once the work does start, you've done all your plans, you shared it with the building contractor, everybody's clear on what's happening. I cannot emphasize enough, take photographs of everything at every single step. It's so brilliantly useful at some point in the future if you decide you want to put a picture up knowing, is there a cable behind there? Does that plasterboard actually have speaker cable or electrical cable going down? You want to know that. And these photos, you can refer to them all the time. Um, we're about to have a uh, Tesla power wall fitted just on the other side of our wall in our garage conversion. And so therefore it's gonna be on the other side of that wall over there. And they're gonna to have to fit something called the gateway, uh, which I'll explain on a, another video I'm gonna do about the Tesla power wall and the solar installation. So that's gonna to have to go in this room because it would normally go in a garage and this is the garage. But I can at least make it tidy because I've got photographs so I know exactly what's behind that cut that plasterboard so that when they install it, they can at least install as much of the cable as possible out of view. And I couldn't have done that without photographs. So take as many photographs as you possibly can. They're a great thing to refer to. Uh, and on top of everything else, just enjoy it. Um, you know, you've got a fantastic new room, but enjoy the journey of building it. It's really exciting to plan it. Um, if you've got any questions on this, you know, by all means, put a comment below. Uh, if, you got, I, I, if I can answer, I will go out of my way to. Uh, otherwise, I'll maybe point you in the direction of somebody who can. So thanks for watching. Um, hopefully the information in this video is useful for you. Um, and I really do hope you enjoy it. Um, the conversion itself is fantastically exciting. I loved ours. Um, but get involved, you know, do know what's going on. Do pay attention because at the end of the day, it's your house. And, and once everybody's gone, you'll be left here. And it's good for you to have a good understanding about why everything does what it does and the way it does it. Um, if you've enjoyed the video, uh, please give it a like down below. I do appreciate your support and please do subscribe. Um, you'll have seen probably some from, from some of the videos that I have put together. I am trying to help people, support people and hopefully maybe save you money along the way. So uh, your support would be much appreciated. Just click the subscribe button below, click the like button below and, uh, and I'll keep creating the content. Um, thanks again for listening. And as I said, any questions, please just put them uh, below in the comments. I would love to hear them and if I can answer them, I will absolutely do my best. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.